Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, look, um, this is going to be a talk about orthogonal polynomials, self-adjoint operators. I'm going to be talking about some what's called left definite operator theory. And there's going to be lots of combinatorics in this talk. Um, listen, feel free to stop me at any point, uh, you know, during the lecture, or if you want, you can wait and ask your questions af after the talk. I'm going to begin by just talking about a little bit of combinatorics, and I'll try to explain you how it, uh, you know, uh, you know how it uh, plays a role in this operator theory that I've been talking about. So I'm going to just for a minute talk about some very classical uh, combinatorial numbers called Stirling numbers of the second kind. I think everybody knows, uh, uh, you know, what the Stirling numbers count. It's the number of ways of uh, putting n objects into j indistinguishable boxes. Um, for example, uh, S53 is 25, S62 is 31. I think we'll see these numbers on the next page, but try to calculate them if you're a student, because it's, you know, it's a little tricky. You've got to follow the rule on, on what these numbers are. These numbers were, of course, discovered by James Sterling, uh, you know, who, who uh, lived from 1692 to 1770. Uh, this is also the same Sterling that came up with the famous approximation to the factorial uh, involving uh, pi and the number e. It's a, you know, it's a remarkable formula that's still being used today. But what Sterling did, he, he discovered these Sterling numbers of the second kind. He didn't name them that. The, these are named by some Dutch mathematicians later. But he discovered properties of these numbers and how they related to certain infinite series called Newton series, okay? Um, and and look, at, look at this display I've got below. So, for example, if you look at the second line, z squared, of course, z squared is just z plus z times z minus one, right? Everything canceled, you're left with z squared. But if you express z squared in terms of what are called falling factorials, you'll see that those bold numbers one and one in the second line, they, these are Stirling numbers of the second kind. And look at z cubed, how you can write z cubed in terms of falling factors. You get the Bernoulli, excuse me, you get the Stirling numbers one, three, and one. And same thing with z to the fourth. You get the Stirling numbers of the second kind, one, seven, six, and one, okay? So here's a picture of Stirling's 1730 book. There's, there's a picture of the cover. And then inside that book, you see this table. Uh, you know, for example, if you look at that first row and go across six, okay? So go across six boxes on the first row and then go down two. So then you'll see the number 31, okay? Or if you go across five and down three, you'll see the number 25. Well, 25 is just going to be S5 three, okay? So these are the famous Sterling numbers of the second kind. Uh, it plays a role in the operator theory that I'm gonna be talking about. And I also wanna tell you about a new set of combinatorial numbers. Well, they're not really, they're not really new. They're 20 years old now, but uh, I, I, I wanna tell you about these things called Legendre Sterling numbers, and we'll compare them to Sterling numbers of the second kind. So, you know, about 20 years ago, when I was studying a problem in operator theory, I, I, I discovered a new application of Stirling numbers of the second kind that involved the classical second order Laguerre differential equation. Okay, now there's the classical Laguerre expression. I've written it in what is called Lagrangian symmetric form. Okay, now, it's not clear why I did this yet, but I'll try to make this clear later on. What, you know, I'm, I'm going to be taking powers of this guy, but before I do that, just 
just remember the importance of this Laguerre expression. The, if you take the polynomial of degree r, uh, this, this is the Laguerre polynomial, okay? It's the solution of L of y equals r times y, okay? Um, so the Laguerre polynomials are solutions of this differential equation, or, or more accurately, they're um, eigenfunctions of the uh, Laguerre differential equation. Now, what I want you to try to remember, everybody, is what the eigenvalues are for Laguerre. So I'm going to denote these guys by R, and remember that R is going to range over all the non-negative integers. So, so try to remember that, okay? Uh, the eigenvalues for Laguerre are going to be just R, where R is any non-negative integer. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to remember another eigenvalue for the Legendre, but we'll come to that in a minute. Okay, so this is to be explained better by me in this lecture, but I need to know what the nth composite power of the Laguerre expression is. So if I take the Laguerre expression and I compose it with itself, that'll give me a fourth order equation. If I compose it with itself three times, that gives me a, a six order expression. So what I've displayed there is the nth composite power of the Laguerre expression written in uh, Lagrangian symmetric form. And I, I, I hope you can see my cursor, but these coefficients, those are precisely the Stirling numbers of the second kind. Okay, so this was kind of a new application of these numbers back then. Now, the natural thing is, <laughs> why am I doing this? Why am I taking this nth power? Well, this is the key point of this lecture, and I'll explain why, okay? But I want to explain by considering another example, okay? And then we'll compare it with Laguerre. And the example that I want to look at in some detail is Legendre's second order equation, okay? This is the one that has Legendre polynomials as eigenfunctions. And you're going to see that when we take the nth composite power of Legendre, we're going to generate these new combinatorial numbers called the Legendre Sterling numbers, okay? Just like, you know, this is similar, we'll get a formula similar to the nth power of Laguerre, okay? So that's kind of the whole point. And there's combinatorics, there's operator theory, there's self-adjoint operators here. It's, you know, involves a lot of different areas of math. Okay, now here's, I, I wanna tell you a funny story here, okay? Maybe some of you have seen this before, but, I think I learned about this maybe, uh, oh, I don't know, less than 20 years ago. So this picture, you'll see this in Howard Eves and Dirk Struitt book on the history of mathematics. And this was believed to be a portrait of my hero, Adrien Marie Legendre, okay? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is what everybody thought Legendre looked like. Well, it was discovered in 2005 by two students at the uh, University of Strasbourg in France that this is actually a portrait of Louis Legendre, who was a, he was a very shadowy figure during the French Revolution, and he was no relation at all to Adrien Marie, okay? So we really do not know what Legendre looked like, okay? These portraits that are in history books, they're not Adrian Marie. Well, okay, here's where the story gets kind of funny. There's a caricature of Legendre that was discovered in the library of, you know, at, at a university in France in 2008. So the, this, this cartoon character this is all we've got to go on to have any idea what the great mathematician Adrien Marie Legendre looked like. It, it, you know, when I first heard about that, I couldn't believe it. 
that, you know, it's, it's too bad that, you know, we remember this guy by, well, we don't remember him by this cartoon character. Of course, we remember him by his great mathematics in so many areas. Okay, so Legendre's equation, there I've got it displayed, okay? This is usually, and I've written it in uh, Lagrangian symmetric form too. This equation is usually studied on the interval minus one to one. Uh, the points plus or minus one are singular points of the differential equation. And in most books, you'll see that this extra ky term that I've put in is usually left out, okay? Uh, and it's fine to leave it out, but in order for me to apply what is called left definite theory, which I'll describe in a few minutes, I definitely need that K to be positive. And there's no harm in putting that term in. All it does, you guys, is it just shifts the spectrum, uh, K units to the right, okay? So whatever the eigenvalues were that produced Legendre polynomials, you're just gonna add the factor K to them. So, you know, nothing changes, you know, as, as far as solutions. Yeah, the rth degree Legendre polynomial, P sub R of X, satisfies that eigenvalue equation that I've got displayed there, okay? So what I want you to remember is that well, what I call the principal part of the eigenvalue is just r into r plus one, okay? Where r ranges over no, all non-negative integers, okay? So try to store that away and remember it. So remember for Laguerre, the eigenvalues are r, and for Legendre, the eigenvalues are r into r plus one. And in both cases, R ranges over all non-negative integers. So try to remember that, because it, it this will be important towards the end of the talk, okay? And it's well known that the Legendre polynomials form a complete orthogonal set uh, in H. Okay, I just want to point out that in succeeding slides, H is going to be my classical L2 space on minus one, one with weight function one. Okay, everybody okay so far? Okay, now, um, here's where I'm gonna get into some operator theory now, okay? So I'm gonna define an operator um, from L2 into L2, and the operator is just gonna be my Legendre expression. So A of F, you just plug in F into your Legendre expression, okay? Now the domain of A, it's gonna be all complex valued functions on minus one, one, such that F and F prime are locally AC uh, on the interval minus one, one, and I need F and my L of F to belong to L2. Plus, I need these boundary conditions to be satisfied. That as X approaches plus or minus one, one minus X squared times F prime approaches zero, okay? Now, you know, for students out there that haven't seen absolute continuity, th this isn't quite true, but just, you know, think of continuous functions. Th th that's wrong, but it's, it's not, I mean, it's very wrong, but it's okay for this discussion if, if you've never seen AC before, okay? Just think of continuity. Okay, now there's this powerful theory in, dif in differential operators called the glassman krein nymark theory, okay? It's a recipe that uh, tells you all self-adjoint extensions for, uh, you know, an nth order differential equation, okay? And in this case, it tells me that this operator A that I've defined is self-adjoint in L2. It's got the Legendre polynomials as eigenfunctions, and the spectrum of A is the eigenvalues that we just spoke about a minute ago. So R and R plus one plus K. So notice I've shifted the eigenvalues K units to the right, okay? Now, this is getting me closer and closer now to talking about left definite theory. So if I let F and G belong to the domain of A, look at the L2 inner product of AF with G. 
okay? Uh, so, you know, basically you're gonna do some integration by parts. There's gonna be an integrated out term that, you know, you can easily show goes to zero, okay? And then you're left with this, what's called the Dirichlet integral on the right-hand side, okay? Now, let's see, if I put my cursor over this, uh, let's let F equals G, okay, in, in this inner product. If F is equal to G, then that term, that term right there where my cursor is, that's non-negative. So the L2 inner product of AF with F will be bigger than or equal to the integral of that part there. And that just simply says the inner product of AF with F is bigger than or equal to K times the inner product of F with F for all F in the domain of A. And what that means, you guys, that says that A is bounded below by K times the identity operator in L2. And it's these operators that are bounded below by a positive constant, okay, that play a very significant role in what I call left definite theory, okay? So I'm now going to give you guys a quick crash course in that, and then we'll return to the Legendre equation. All right, uh, anybody have any questions at this point? Is, is this making sense? Can you hear me okay? Yes, Lance, everything is okay. Yes. We, we keep the equations for the end. It's okay. Of the talk, but everything is okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I, yeah, I'm not hearing too well here. Is, is that a question for me? No, 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 everything is okay. We keep okay. the equations for the end of the talk. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Everything is okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. So look, I'm going to give you a crash course now in what I call left definite theory. Okay. This is a theory that can be traced back to Hermann Weyl and uh, right around 1910. Okay. So I'm going to full show you this full slide here. So suppose a is a self-adjoint operator and it's bounded below in some Hilbert space H, okay? Now look how I've written that. I've written H to be V with an inner product, okay? So what I'm doing here, you guys, is I'm distinguishing uh, between the underlying vector space V and the topological space H that the inner product gives us. Okay, um, it's not really important to do that for this talk, but if I was to give like a long talk on left definite theory, it's very important to distinguish between H and the underlying vector space, okay? And I can explain that later if somebody wants me to. Okay, so we're gonna suppose that A is bounded below by K times the identity operator. Well, by the spectral theorem, if I let R be any positive real number, doesn't have to be an integer. Then a to the power r is self-adjoint, and it's bounded below as well by k to the power r times the identity, okay? So now what I wanna do is I wanna give you an abstract definition of what I mean by a left definite space associated with the operator a in the Hilbert space h that we start off in. So here's the definition. Let's let R be positive and, and let's let V sub R be a subspace of V. And suppose I have an inner product that I subscript with R. Suppose that's an inner product on V sub R, okay? Now let's let H sub R be the resulting inner product space, all right? We're gonna call H sub R a rth left definite space associated with the original pair H and A if the following five things happen. So H sub R has to be complete, it's gotta be a Hilbert space. The domain of A to the R has to be a subset of V sub R. The domain of A to the R has to be dense in H sub R. See, already in two and three, you see the how I've distinguished between VR and HR. Property two is a vector space property. 
property three is a topological property, okay? And then property four, it compares the earth inner product with the original inner product in H, okay? Specifically, the earth inner product of X with itself has to be bigger than or equal to K to the R times the H inner product of X and X. And that's gotta be true for all X in my subspace V sub R, okay? And here's the fifth property. Okay, if I take X in the domain of A to the R and Y to belong to V sub R, then the Rth left definite product of X and Y will be the ordinary inner product of A to the power X with Y. Okay, now, so all five of those are needed to uh, talk about a left definite space and you can't drop any of them. Okay, we have counterexamples if I only consider four of the five or something, right? So they're all equally important. But in a sense, property five is the most important. And the reason is we, we can kind of see what five is saying. Five is telling us that the rth left definite or product is generated by the rth power of A. Okay? So that's how we generate these left definite inner products. We look at the rth power of A. See, that's why I wanted to know what, you, you know, the powers of the Laguerre expression were. Okay, it's probably, it's because of property five. Okay. All right, all, all is fine. I can make a definition anytime I want, but does it have any substance? So here's what the theorem is, okay? So if A is a self-adjoint operator in H, that's bounded below by K times I, then let R be positive. And um, let's let V sub R be the domain of A to the R over two. And let's let the Rth inner product of X and Y be the ordinary inner product of A to the R over two acting on X a to the r over two acting on y, okay? And now let h sub r be uh, v sub r with this uh, rth left definite or product. Then h sub r satisfies those five properties on the previous page. In fact, it's the unique rth left definite space associated with my original pair, okay? Now here's what was interesting when we did this theory. So if I took a to be a bounded operator, I get nothing new. Um, every V sub R is the same as my original vector space. Uh, and my original inner product and my Rth left definite inner product, they're all equivalent for all R positive. So there's no left definite theory if A is a bounded operator. So what happens? for unbounded operators. Well, that's where the theory lives. So if A is unbounded, then V sub R is a proper subspace of V. And uh, if R is less than S, V sub S will be a proper subspace of V sub R, okay? Moreover, none of the three inner products I've got listed there will be equivalent. So the left definite theory lives for unbounded operators. And here's, here's something from, you know, interesting from the viewpoint of orthogonal polynomials. So if, say, the phi sub n forms a complete set of orthogonal eigenfunctions of A in my original Hilbert space H, then they also form a complete orthogonal set in every one of those uh, left definite spaces H sub R. And remember, there's a whole continuum of these left definite spaces. Okay, because it works for any R greater than zero. Okay, so I want to get back now to the Legendre example. Now, before I broke away to tell you a little bit about uh, left definite theory, um, we saw that the Legendre operator is bounded below by K times the identity in L2, okay? So that means the left definite theory 
tells us that there's a continuum of Hilbert spaces, H sub R, with inner products subscripted by R, associated with the Legendre operator that produces the Legendre polynomials, okay? So question is, what are these spaces, okay? Well, unfortunately, and still at the present time, and this has been for 20 years, uh, we can only effectively determine these spaces and operators when n is a natural number. So h sub r exists and is unique for all r positive, but I can only tell you what h1 is, h2 is, h3 is, and so on. I can't tell you what h a half is yet. And this is an ongoing project I have with a couple of colleagues at Baylor. And, you know, interpolation theory, Sobolovs, I mean, it's, it's a tough problem. Okay. Yeah, so I just want to emphasize from that property five of the definition. Note that the space is H sub N and the associated inner products. They're determined from the integral powers of the Legendre expression. Okay, so the nth composite power of Legendre is going to produce these spaces for us, okay? Okay, now here's, here's the embarrassing part for me. So finding the explicit form of this nth composite power, this took me three years. I mean, okay, I was doing some other, other things, but uh, no, really, it took me three years to get this thing. And when you think about it, you know, okay, so Legendre is a second order. I needed to know what the 40th power was for this thing, right? Well, that's an 80th order differential equation. Okay, Mathematica could tell me that, okay? Mathematica didn't like me asking that, but it could tell me what that 80th order DE was. But the thing I had to do was put that thing in Lagrangian symmetric form. So, you know, it took a while to get this thing done. All right, now, now that I've solved the problem, now I can look back on it. And I'm telling you guys that I can argue now that it shouldn't have taken me three years. It should have taken me three minutes. And I'll explain why later. But that's just the fun, frustrating part of doing research, right? This is the beauty of mathematics. So, I mean, th this, this is uh, something I want to say to all graduate students. Uh, you're going to get stuck. But the thing is, we get stuck too. And it's just a matter of sticking at it, you know. L maybe leave the problem alone for a little while. Come back. Um, doing mathematics is hard. It's frustrating. But it's so beautiful. Don't ever give up, guys. Okay. Now, uh, here's what I want, want to tell you. So take that Legendre expression, L of Y, and after three years, here's what the nth composite power was, okay? There's those coefficients C sub zero and C sub J. Maybe for now, you guys, I mean, that's, that's pretty uh, intimidating, those formulas. Think of K as being zero right now, okay? Because that's usually the way the Legendre problem is studied, okay? So when k is zero, then c sub zero vanishes, so I can really start this sum at one instead. And if k is um, zero, then these coefficients c sub j are these numbers that I've called Legendre Sterling numbers, okay? So, you know, don't worry about that part. Don't worry about, you know, this part in here. Just concentrate on these numbers, what I've called PSNJ. These are the numbers uh, called the Legendre Sterling numbers, all right? And again, uh, this, this, took me, uh, this took me three years to find. And, but there's now an explicit formula for those uh, numbers and they're all positive. Okay, now, now that we've got those numbers, again, I'm referring back to property five in the definition of left definite space. I've now got these nth powers. I've got these coefficients, the Legendre Sterling numbers. Now I can tell you what the nth left definite space is, okay? 
So H sub n is going to be this vector space V sub n with this uh, subscripted n inner product. There's what V sub n turns out to be. Okay. Now remember V sub n, according to the theory, that's the same as the domain of A to the n over 2 power. Okay. All right. I, and I don't want to belabor this. This is not the important part of my talk, but you can compute these spaces and inner products, okay? I really want to focus more on the combinatorics now because I, I think it's really kind of cool, okay? Okay, so yeah, before I get to that, uh, in each of these nth left definite spaces, so H sub n, the Legendre polynomials form a complete orthogonal set. See, we knew that from that theorem I proved or theorem I stated for left, left definite um, spaces. In fact, there is the explicit orthogonality uh, in the nth left definite space. Okay. So, you, you know, you can, you can compute all of these things. Now, here's something that really kind of blew me away. There is a surprising amount of smoothness for functions that belong to uh, these left definite spaces. In fact, if I take an F in the domain of the nth power of my original Legendre self-adjoint operator, that tells me that the nth derivative of F is L2. That's an incredible amount of smoothness. It, it, it's just something special about these polynomials that you know generate all this smoothness in these left definite spaces. Okay, so all right, don't don't hurt your eyes looking at this. But I've got two tables that I I hope you can see. I mean, uh, you, <laughs> if you're doing this on your phone, you're going to have a hard time seeing these numbers. But it's not a big deal, okay? Uh, the top table is just a list of Sterling numbers of the second kind. Okay. The bottom table is uh, these new numbers, these Legendre Sterling numbers, okay? And you can see just by comparing these tables, these Legendre Sterling numbers grow fast, right? Um, so, you know, a natural question to ask is combinatorially, do they mean anything, okay? Hang on for one second here. Okay, yeah. All right, so I, I, again, I don't know if you can see these tables very well, but it's not that important. It's this next page that I hope you can see better, it's, um, but it's also small, and I'll try to explain better, okay? Is that difficult for you guys to see? Maybe so, eh? Look, this is a table comparing properties of Sterling numbers of the second kind with these new numbers called Legendre Sterling, okay? Now, let me just read off the left. So both numbers have what's called a vertical recurrence relation. Both numbers have a rational generating function. Both numbers have a triangular recurrence relation. Both numbers have horizontal generating functions. And both numbers can be inverted in a certain sense to reveal first kind numbers, okay? Now, the one that I want to focus on is the rational generating function, okay? Maybe you can already see it. Um, I've known the rational generating function for the Sterling numbers of the second kind for probably over 40 years, okay? You look at that rational generating function, and now look at the rational generating function for Legendre Sterling, okay? Just look at those denominators in the product. There you see an R. Here you see an R and the R plus one. What does that remind you of? See? Rs are the eigenvalues for Laguerre which involves Sterling numbers of the second kind. R and R plus one, they're the eigenvalues for Legendre, okay? 
Now here's, you know, here's the maddening thing. It took me three years to find these numbers and three years to find these spaces. But the answer was sitting right in front of me, really, because I knew this formula, but I never viewed the R's there as the eigenvalues for Laguerre polynomials. Had I realized that, then I would have gotten that immediately, okay? And I really, it would have taken me three minutes to find these numbers and spaces. So that was, that was kind of funny, but again, that's just the nature of research. Okay, see, uh, in fact, let me just briefly tell you about this story. So Richard Wellman and I wrote this stuff on left definite theory. Uh, I think the paper was published in 2002. And as an example in that paper, we did the Laguerre polynomials, okay? So, you know, it took us a while to figure out the nth power of Laguerre, but I, I recognized pretty quickly that the coefficients were Stirling numbers of the second kind, okay? So we got that example done. Then what I wanted to do was to do the nth power of the Jacobi equation. Now that involves two parameters, alpha and beta. Well, I started taking powers of Jacobi with alpha and beta both greater than negative one, and it was just a mess. I just could not see through it all. So then I decided to just let alpha and beta both be zero. That's the Legendre case. It still took three years to solve, right? But once I saw this connection right here in the rational generating function, the harder case, which was Jacobi, I was able to do it in about three minutes, okay? Once I saw the pattern. So it was kind of funny. It was a lot of time spent, but it worked out in the end. Okay. My last little bit here, I want to tell you um, some things about the Legendre Sterling numbers and what they count, okay? So as a reminder, the classic Sterling numbers of the second kind, you know they're important in combinatorics. Uh, at the beginning of this lecture, I reminded you by saying that uh, SNJ is the number of ways of putting N objects into J non-empty indistinguishable boxes. Okay, so that's well known, well studied. What about the Legendre Sterling numbers? Do they count anything? Now remember from that table I showed you, they grow much faster, okay? So it's not gonna be something as simple as what the Sterling numbers of the second kind count. Well, the answer is yes, they do count something. This was a project that I worked with George Andrews on, uh, I think for a couple of years. And I, t I, I gotta be honest with you, it, George kind of took the helm here. Uh, he's so good at combinatorics and I think he figured this problem out in you know less, less than a year. All right, to see what they count, what we're gonna do is consider two copies of each positive number between one and n, okay? So you, you know, I'm gonna have a one sub one and a one sub two and so on, okay? You think of these as having different colors. So uh, if the number is subscripted by one, we can think of that as being red. And if the number is subscripted by two, we can think of that as being blue, okay? Something like that, okay? All right, and uh, I need some uh, uh, way of comparing numbers. So for positive integers, P and Q less than or equal to N, and I and J, these are my subscripts being one and two. I'm gonna say that P sub I is greater than Q sub J, simply if P is bigger than Q, okay? I don't think we really need it. It doesn't really show up in the succeeding pages, but it's something we needed in the proof. Okay. Now I'm gonna describe two rules on how to fill J plus one boxes with uh, the numbers one sub one, one sub two, and so on, okay? Here's what the rules are. The zero box, okay? This is the only box that may be empty, and it may not contain both copies of any number, 
okay? So if the zero box is non-empty and it contains two sub one, it can't contain two sub two, okay? The other J boxes are indistinguishable and each is non-empty. For each such box, the smallest element in that box must contain both copies or colors of the smallest number, but no other elements can have both copies in that box. Okay? And here's the theorem from uh, George and myself. Uh, for n and j non-negative integers, and j less than or equal to n, the Legendre Sterling number PSNJ, this is the number of different distributions according to the above two rules. Okay, so that's what they count. Now, am I happy with this combinatorial interpretation? Not really. I, I really like to see somebody come up with a different interpretation of these numbers. You know, like people standing around in a circle. That You know, that's the sort of thing I'd like to see happen. But this is all we've got right now, and it's kind of a cool interpretation. But, you know, it's not, I don't think it's as cool as the way you interpret Sterling numbers of the second kind. Anyway, guys, I've come to the end. I thank you all very much.